do that. Oh, yeah. Okay, I just started the recording. And now I'm going to share. Thank you. Okay, here we are. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, I'm really quite a history buff, and I think it's important to know a little bit about the history of wireless technology and how amateur radio came to be what it is right now and how it is really, really important in uh, uh, relation to the current technology we have nowadays that we take for granted. And uh, okay, first of all, what is the basis and purpose of amateur radio? Amateur radio uh, has been established. It's recognized internationally. Uh, it's uh, here in the United States, it's governed by the Federal Communications Commission, uh, which is a federal organization also known as the FCC. And uh, their rules uh, that govern amateur radio are called part 97. And the very beginning of those rules, there's the definition of what amateur radio is. It's, I, it's uh, I defined as an amateur radio service uh, with the following principles and the purposes. First of all, to recognize and enhance the value of the amateur service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications and uh, radio amateurs have been vital for uh, public safety in cases where the infrastructure has uh, fallen down. For example, during uh, disasters like hurricanes, earthquakes, when um, electric power goes off, the telephones go down, internet goes down, we still have uh, communications via radio. And uh, we provide a very in, uh, important service uh, for our public safety that way. Also, uh, we continue and extend our ability to contribute to the advancement of radio art. Uh, uh, radio amateurs have been pioneers into a lot of the technology that you have nowadays. Uh, and it's people tinkering and learning and trying to push the envelope to see what we could do with wireless technology that has brought us a lot of the things that we enjoy and we take for granted nowadays. Also, um, yeah, the encouragement and improvement of amateur service through rules which provide for advancing skills in communication and the technical phases of the art. Communications is the uh, just the operating day to day where you get on a microphone and talk through the microphone or use a telegraph key or use a computer keyboard uh, and the procedures to be able to transmit messages uh, efficiently and effectively uh, in different circumstances. Expansion of the existing reservoir within the amateur radio service of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts. And this, of course, is for the benefit of the society as a whole. Uh, we uh, have a train, we're people who just have this uh, passion for learning about this stuff can uh, use amateur radio to develop their skills and then go on into, if they want to, professions that have, that have to do with, uh, with communications, such as uh, the media or uh, uh, designing electronic uh, electronic um, systems uh, that we use for communications, uh, wireless asp wireless uh, applications of all kinds. And uh, finally, continuation extension of our unique ability to enhance international goodwill. Uh, as uh, amateur radio operators, we can communicate with other amateurs throughout the world and all different nations. And uh, Historically, we've done that despite all the political differences that may exist uh, among different countries. As an amateur radio operator, I have communicated with people in uh, China, in uh, Soviet Union before when Russia used to be a communist country. And uh, these were adversaries, political adversaries of the United States. But still, it allows us to uh, communicate and interact with people on a human basis from one culture to another to realize the common humanity, humanity we have and really extend that goodwill between our, our peoples. Uh, radio is not just the radio that you see in your car because nowadays uh, we, we're so spoiled with having handheld devices like cell phones, um, PCs, uh, that we communicate so much with that. And about the only time we actually have a radio that we tune the dial on is the one that you see inside your car. But there's a lot more than that. You see all of these devices, the cell phone has actually radios in it that allow the wireless communication. Um, satellite TV uses radio technology, uh, Wi-Fi. There's so many different things. Um, let's go back to the basics. And I wanna go just explain a little bit about the history. Electricity is not anything that's really new. It was known to the ancients, 
uh, back in 600 BC, the ancient Greek philosopher Thales of Miletos discovered that if you rub amber with cat fur, you able to uh, uh, attract feathers with it. That was a form of static electricity that the ancients knew about. And um, he also observed that there was a mineral called lodestone or a magnetite that attracts iron. So magnets were known also to the ancients. Uh, now, where did we find that there was a relationship between electricity and magnetism? That started back in 1820 when the Danish physicist uh, Ørsted observed that a compass needle that was near a wire would move when you pass electric current switch on and off. Uh, and this was the ex experiment that he essentially did. He had a wire connected to a battery and, and a compass needle would move. And it was just a serendipity finding. He went ahead and, and uh, further investigated that. And there were a number of other physicists who also did that. Uh, Andre Ampere, Michael Faraday, James Maxwell, and Heinrich Hertz, because this was a, a, such a curious thing. They had no idea that there was any connection between electricity and magnetism until that time. Well, James Maxwell actually theorized uh, on the existence of electromagnetic waves that feels that would travel through space at light speed. That was back in 1865. He himself uh, never demonstrated that, but he just figured it out through mathematic formulas. And uh, uh, this is a little aside, just a tangent, just a re reminder about the electromagnetic spectrum. This is a uh, spectrum of all forms of electromagnetic energy, depending on their frequency and the wavelength. Uh, radio waves are down at the lower um, end of the spectrum to the left, which is the longest wavelengths and the lowest frequencies. And as you go up in frequency, you go into the microwaves, infrared waves, uh, ultraviolet, of course, the visible lights in there, x-rays and gamma rays. It's all part of a, of a continuous spectrum of electromagnetic energy that we're in. And the radio frequency spectrum is just a small part of that. Uh, again, it's at the longer wavelength of that entire spectrum. And amateur radio operators uh, have uh, assigned slots in all parts of uh, the radio frequency spectrum where we can operate and uh, experiment with and, and work with. Heinrich Hertz, uh, this uh, uh, was one of the uh, early uh, physicists uh, who uh, he actually was the first to prove the existence of electromagnetic waves. He did this uh, uh, with an experiment back in 1886 uh, where uh, this is uh, the equipment that he used. He had a device on the right side of the table uh, was uh, generating sparks. Uh, and then the, the, the device on the left, which is a loop that had a little spark gap would actually show sparks jumping between uh, the two little balls there on the top there, even though there was no physical connection. Uh, so this way he was able to actually demonstrate that there was some kind of invisible radiation that was traveling from one to the other uh, without any physical connection. And this was the first uh, demonstration that these invisible electromagnetic waves actually existed. And this is a notable uh, comment that he made after he did this test. Uh, he said, I do not think that the wireless waves I have discovered have any practical application. Um, it, so um, it's kind of um, uh, funny to think about that now because it, the actual implications uh, of his uh, discovery have opened up a tremendous world for us uh, with wireless technology. Samuel Morse, I'm just going to mention in passing, uh, he worked with wires, uh, using wires to communicate. He was a, one of the first people to do that. And he invented the telegraph. Uh, and the person who uh, decided that he was going to try to merge these two technologies, telegraph communication and wireless um, uh, transmission of, of waves was Guglielmo Marconi. Uh, he was born in Italy in 1874. He first learned about the work of Heinrich Hertz uh, and, uh, and Maxwell when he was 17 years old. And uh, he, uh, at that age, really had an interest in trying to use wireless waves to send telegraph messages. So he was tinkering. He was uh, uh, working uh, on his farm, uh, his family's farm uh, with this. And uh, in 1895, he succeeded in sending a wireless message over two miles using this primitive equipment. Uh, this picture that you see him here, he was 21 years old. 
Uh, and just two, year, two years later, he was able to uh, demonstrate sending wireless messages over the open sea over a short distance. And then in 1901, he actually accomplished sending messages across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this was, you can imagine what the implications was, what, for this was. Uh, if uh, you may have heard about the uh, famous uh, steamship, the Titanic, that uh, sunk in 1912. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, steamships um, were being uh, in, uh, equipped with wireless, uh, uh, wireless transmission and receiving equipment. It was thought that it was a way of being able to send uh, telegrams uh, so that you could, you know, just give advance notice that you were going to arrive at a certain location because this was way before we had air travel, you know, people would travel across the ocean on these, uh, on these ocean liners. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, having that wireless on board actually saved tremendous amount of life because when they hit the iceberg and started sinking in this ship, they sent out an SOS and they got the help of many other ships that came to their assistance and saved the lives of many of the passengers that otherwise would have drowned in the middle of the ocean. So this was a absolute uh, demonstration of the value of, uh, of having wireless. And uh, Marconi uh, capitalized on that. He, he started the Marconi Corporation and uh, uh, was really important in equipping uh, uh, a lot of the ships. And this was considered to be one of the main reasons for uh, for doing this. And of course, the, the communications they were doing was Morse code, and they were using these spark transmitters, which uh, was a very primitive way of communicating. Uh, Reginald Fessenden is an interesting uh, fellow. What he did was he took one of these transmitters and he took a microphone from uh, the, the similar type of microphone that they were using in telephones. And he was able to uh, superimpose voice on a radio transmission for the first time. Uh, he did this experiment back in 1900 and 1906. And the telegraph operators were amazed that they were listening to their headphones, listening for Morse code, and they were hearing voices and music coming over. So uh, he was another uh, uh, pioneer uh, experimenter with, uh, with, uh, with radio. And I have to say that Marconi, you would probably Called the, the the original amateur radio operator because we were all experimenters at heart. Lee DeForest uh, is another inventor that uh, he invented the uh, the vacuum tube, which uh, was used for amplifying uh, radio signals. And this was a tremendous uh, step forward because we didn't have to depend anymore on these high-powered spark transmitters. Now you were with with uh, amplifiers, you were able to get more sensitive receivers. And you can use these uh, vacuum tube amplifiers to give more pure signals on the radio other than the uh, sparks that they used to use for transmitting. Hiram Percy Maxim, I'm going to mention, was uh, one of the uh, early radio experimenters. Uh, he was born in Brooklyn, but he lived most of his life uh, near New Haven, Connecticut, uh, near Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, he was, uh, he founded the American Radio Relay League, which is the National Association for Radio Amateurs. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, almost 200,000 members uh, uh, here in the United States. This is our national organization. And uh, he uh, single-handedly pretty much saved amateur radio after World War I. During World War I, the US Navy had pretty much prohibited any amateur, any people from broadcasting on radio because they were, consider they were concerned that uh, it would be used for, uh, for enemy purposes. Uh, so there was no access at all for transmitting on radio, but uh, Hiram Percy Maxim and uh, some of his friends uh, lobbied in Washington DC uh, for the US Navy to release some of these frequencies uh, so that amateur radio could, be, um, could return to the air. And he was successful in doing that. So we consider him to be the father of amateur radio here in the United States. He is the founder of uh, the league. Yes. And uh, here are some of the accomplishments that we, um, we claimed here in amateur radio. The first time we had a transatlantic uh, amateur contact was in 1927. Of course, uh, we were using 
stuff that we were building in our homes and stuff. We weren't using like what Marconi did. Marconi, of course, he had a, uh, he was doing it commercially. So he had a lot of uh, resources to build very powerful transmitters and big towers to do his first communications. And this was the first time that we actually did it from one home to another home across the Atlantic in 1927. Uh, let's zoom up to the 1970s. And by, the by that time, we started to have compact uh, transistorized equipment. I uh, actually had a little handheld radio like this uh, back around 1980. And uh, some amateur operators actually uh, uh, learned how to uh, interface these with the telephone system. Back then we didn't have cell phones uh, and all the cell all the telephones were either uh, touch tone or rotary dial and they were all wired. <laughs> it was all landline system. So this was uh, quite a uh, impressive thing for me to carry around that I could show. I whipped this out of my uh, purse here and I would just be able to dial a few numbers on the, on the push buttons on there and, and make a phone call. Uh, it was something that was unheard of back then. So uh, this is the technology that we uh, pioneered that led to the cell phones that we all have now. Uh, also back in 1961 during the space race. Okay, did we get dropped or something? Yeah, for a bit, you were frozen for a bit, but. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I need to do the uh, screen sharing again. Mm -hmm. It says host disables participant screen sharing. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll make you co-host. I uh, host again here. Uh, okay. Okay. Here I go. Back again. You were in the 1970s and the handheld. Okay, you heard about the uh, we, we that we did the precursors of the cell system uh, using uh, what we call auto patch. Yes. Uh, in uh, 1961, uh, we. Uh, uh, sent up the first amateur radio satellite. That was during the, uh, the, the beginnings of the space race. And uh, we called the first uh, uh, satellite Oscar-1. That's orbiting satellite carrying um, amateur radio. It was a very primitive single transmitter in there with uh, transistors and a battery that uh, it did uh, just send some Morse code, uh, very simple, simple Morse code is sent HI, HI uh, as it was traveling around in uh, hundreds and thousands of amateurs around the world receded as it passed over them. So this was one of our uh, pioneering efforts. Uh, in the uh, early years of the uh, space shuttle, 1983, uh, the uh, shuttle amateur radio experiment was uh, started where astronauts that with amateur radio brought the amateur radio equipment up in their uh, shuttles and actually communicated around the world uh, from space. And in 1996, that was changed to the amateur radio on the International Space Station. And there are stations, there is a station up on the uh, space station right now. Most of the astronauts up there have amateur radio licenses and uh, regularly schedule uh, communications with schools around the world uh, when they schedule that. And uh, they can operate amateur radio for their enjoyment as well while they're up there. Let's see, next. Okay, who are amateur radio operators? Right now we have over 700,000 licensed hands in the United States. Uh, the licenses are given by the Federal Communications Commission after passing a, uh, an exam that covers uh, some of the rules and uh, some theory about uh, radio and electronics. You get a distinctive call sign when you get your license. The, call, the, the license lasts for 10 years and you can renew it. Uh, every 10 years, you don't need to take an exam anymore after you get your first uh, license. Although you can always upgrade if there's right now, I think three different levels of license. The entry license is a technician, which gives you privileges pretty much on VHF and UHF, which is short distance um, line of sight type communications. And if you wanted uh, privileges on uh, the uh, high frequency uh, bands, which allows you international shortwave communication using the ionosphere, um, it's, you upgrade to a general or an extra class and you get those privileges as well. We're allowed to transmit with up to 1000 watts of power. Uh, there is no age restrictions and uh, interest can include public, public service at uh, different types of events, which people do like marathon races and, and things like that. Emergency communications uh, uh, for natural disasters 
Uh, you can uh, use it for learning and improving wireless technology if you like to tinker with that kind of thing. Uh, use it to communicate with other people and learning about people in other cultures. Uh, some people like uh, amateur radio as a form of assistive communication. Uh, some uh, individuals, for example, with Asperger's syndrome, autism, uh, who have difficulty with verbal communication, uh, they find it communicating via radio using uh, other technologies helps them to connect better with other people. So that's that's certainly a, a valid use for it as well. And many am many radio amateurs use it to lead them into careers in the media, in STEM and things of that nature. And I just have a, a couple of examples here shortly. Cawthorn McDonald uh, was a radio amateur in uh, Canada. He invented the slow scan television uh, concept in 1957, and it was used for the early NASA space missions. They used it for sending the moving pictures from the Apollo lunar missions back to Earth. So uh, that's like one person. Here's another example. Mr. Joe Taylor, K1JT, um, he uh, got into amateur radio as a high school student. And he says, my senior honors physics project combined knowledge of radio frequency electronics with an appreciation of scientific inquiry to build a working radio telescope. And he did this uh, with the Radio Amateur's Handbook, which is a publication of the American Radio Relay League and an early book on radio astronomy. This was his science project. And uh, he started with that. And the next thing you know, he now has a Nobel Prize in physics because he went on to become a professor of physics, astronomy, and applied math at Princeton University. And he is uh, an active amateur operator right now. He's the author of software for long distance, low power, weak signal digital communications. Uh, he did uh, a lot of his work at uh, the Arecibo Observatory, which some of you may have heard of in Puerto Rico. Recently, there was a disaster there uh, where the uh, part of the antenna fell down. It was, uh, nobody lost their lives, thankfully, but uh, uh, I have to say uh, one of the benefits of being an amateur radio and uh, uh, my being an amateur radio is I was able to connect with an engineer at the Arecibo Observatory uh, and actually go and visit the place. And he uh, took me inside for a, a, a tour uh, of all of the facilities there. It's something that the public generally doesn't get to see. Uh, and uh, we, um, that's the picture of the observatory, the radio telescope dish down in Puerto Rico. And uh, I, as it, when I went for that tour, I took my little hand camcorder and I took some video. Uh, he said, it'd be fine, you know, we took video of all the uh, technical equipment he has in there uh, and what they were doing over the years and the history of it. And uh, I made a little video that I was presenting at uh, a local radio club. And uh, then I was suggested to go ahead and present it at uh, a convention over uh, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I happened to uh, have the opportunity to present that on stage with Dr. Joe Taylor, the Nobel Prize laureate, who was the, the, the guest uh, speaker um, there as well uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the convention. So it was an honor. He did his uh, Nobel Prize work in the same uh, uh, facility here. So, uh, you know, it, it just opens up so many opportunities, things you never imagined. When I was a high school student, I never thought I would have uh, the opportunity to, to see the people I've met. Uh, you become an, when you become a radio amateur, you open your doors to an entire community of, of friends all over the world. You have that in common with them and they will welcome you to their country wherever you're visiting. And um, I can say uh, it's been a, a great lifetime experience for me. Uh, so I started just tinkering and uh, learning about it as a high school student. I have no regrets about it. So uh, and there's so many different uh, uh, aspects of amateur radio that I can't cover them all in this little brief talk. And maybe we could do it some other time. We can talk a little bit about that. So uh, are there any questions? I don't have any, but just thank you for your presentation. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you want to see a few things that I have here. This is a simple uh, handheld radio. You might have seen something like this already. This is a, a VHF, UHF radio. And um, 
I have quite a station over here otherwise. Actually, I'm right next to it. If you want to see some of the equipment, I'll be glad to show it. Let's see if I move the camera. Let me uh, stop the screen sharing here. Okay, I'm going to have to move this camera. I don't the cable wire here. Okay. Let's see. Okay, this is uh, an HF radio down here. I turn on, you can see it shows the frequency on there. Uh, above that, I have another uh, VHF, HF, uh, UHF radio right there. Okay. And this is a uh, this is an amplifier. This will actually transmit up to 500 watts. I don't need that kind of power most of the time, but under poor conditions, uh, when the propagation is not very good, we can turn that on as well. And um, have a few other items up here. Uh, as part of my test equipment, I have an oscilloscope, a uh, number of other devices up there. You can see it's quite a stash. <laughs> And there's a, there's a special uh, afternoon. The time is 12 p.m. Okay, 12 p.m. Anyway, I do have some uh, equipment up here that I'm using for studying uh, propagation of UHF uh, radio waves through the troposphere. And that station is uh, is on constantly. I'm part of a, uh, of a group of uh, other amateur operators here on the West Coast that are doing those studies. And we publish our findings on the internet. So uh, it's awesome. Now, uh, our club, uh, the River City uh, Amateur Radio Communication Society, is uh, interested in sponsoring uh, a station at your school. Uh, we have some equipment that we are uh, wanting to donate to you, and we'll be really glad to set up a station so that you can actually operate from there and uh, get some hands-on experience once you can get back into school, which would be awesome. So, uh, but um, uh, I am glad to come any, back any other time to give any other talks about any of the specific types of uh, activities that we do in amateur radio that I personally have experience with. Uh, if it's something that I don't, I certainly can find other people to, to come and talk with you about those things. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Carroll. Okay, yeah, my, my pleasure. And I hope I didn't bore you too much. And I didn't go over time, did I? No, no, no. You're perfectly on time. And it was very interesting. And we learned a lot in a short amount of time. Okay, thank you. I can stop the recording now? Or yeah. how do I do that? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, there should be a stop button somewhere. And I'm not sure how you can. Oh, yeah, I, I see. I'll stop it now.